it, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> She's smart, period. She's a smart girl. Good morning. The Lord is good. The Lord is faithful. He is merciful and he is gracious. Amen. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. So stand up, lift your hands to the Lord, and let's give him thanks and praise. Let's honor him with our hands raised, with the praises of our mouth. Lift up your praise to him now in Jesus' name. Lord, we bless you and we honor you. We thank you, Lord, for you are good, for your mercy endures forever. We praise you and thank you that your presence is in this place. That you are here with us. You are meeting and having church with us today. What a joy. What a blessing. What an honor to have you with us. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we have liberty here today, Lord. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are in control of what is done and said here today. What we sing, how we sing, what we say, how we say, what we do. Let it all be done to the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody says, yes, Lord, and amen. Okay, I've had my instructions one more time. And you know we have to do what Colson says. What? I'm working on it there. I'm working on it. All right. Just tell Papa buck up and do it. He says, no, that sounds a little disrespectful to me. I don't think I'll say that. All right, Papa, I'll buck up and do it. I can say it. <laughs> oh, yes, I can. <laughs> oh, oh, you've got to count. Oh, pardon me. This is a series on honor. Your honorable Papa Kenneth play. Okay. <laughs> Put your hands together and let's say it together. Ready? I will worship. I will worship. With all of my heart. With all of my heart. And I will praise you. I will praise you. With all of my strength. With all of my strength. I will seek you. I will seek you. 
the people said amen and amen and amen. All right, uh, y'all can sit down. Okie dokie, Miss Justice. Would you please do us the honor of coming up and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag? Where's our little ones that know what to do? Little bit, do you know what to do? Come stand over here, Justice. You see where the blue tape is? Don't go past that. We have to stay inside the blue tape. <laughs> what an honor it is to live in this United States of America. What an honor it is. Kenneth is teaching us on honor. How blessed are we that we were born in this country. And those that weren't are getting here as fast as they can. <laughs> it's kind of like Texas. If you're not born here, you're doing everything you can to get here, right? <laughs> but what a blessing and what an honor to live in this United States of America, the greatest country with all of its troubles, struggles, stupidity, idiocy, <laughs> and all the junk that's going on. We are still blessed. We are very blessed. Amen. We are very, very blessed. So please stand. I realize that it's July the 5th, but it's close enough to the 4th. <laughs> if you didn't do it yesterday, you get the opportunity to do it today. And we are going to show honor to our country and to our flag, to our forefathers, for every person that has died and given their life amen to every person that has been wounded and suffered because they were fighting for this freedom that we have right here today right now so that we can come in this building and we can lift our hands and we can say praise the Lord and nobody's going to hurt us they paid for that privilege amen they paid for that. We stand here. Johnny paid for it in the Gulf War. Who else paid for it? Monty. Vietnam. Loopy. Peacetime. Robert. Peacetime Cold War. Jeremy. No. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. Okay, Justice, I'm going to give you the microphone, okay? You need to step this way, just a little bit. Put it to your mouth and lead up. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So let's sing. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains. From the mountains to the prairie to the oceans, white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. My home, sweet home. And the people say, yes, amen, amen, amen. Amen, y'all can sit down. We got a lot to cover this morning, a lot of, annou of announcements and a lot of, 
Okay, who's online, Miss Kelly? You just went out. You kicked them out. Kelly, don't kick people out of church. When they're coming to church, you don't want to kick them out. It's Carla's fault. Oh, Carl's fault. I was going to say, Carla's not even here. But again, we, we blame Carl when Carl's not here either. So, all right. Courtney from Copper's Cove, she's rooting for Granny. Here she goes. Go, Grandma. Dan and Shasta, yay. They are recovering from the virus. Hallelujah. They have been quarantined for about, uh, they can tell us for sure, I think it's about 10 days now, 8 days, something like that, probably an eternity. I'm sure they think it's an eternity. I would think it was. Um, but they are recovering. They didn't have to go to the hospital. Yay, yay, yay. Okay, and Dana Shasta. Diana, yay. Mahala, good, yay. Margaret, oh, good. Margaret is recovering from high blood pressure. Amen. She is recovering from every effect of high blood pressure, and the doctor will find what is the source of that problem tomorrow. Amen? All right. Tony and Sandra, yay. Glad y'all are here. Good. And who is our visitor back here on the back row? Does someone want to introduce our visitor back here? I think I know who he is, but would someone like to introduce him? That's Justice's dad, Justin. Yay, Justin, we're glad you're here. We haven't seen you in so long. You were a kid the last time we saw you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Is that your baby girl? Oh, your son. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was a little girl. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, there. I did see a little girl. Okay, I wasn't making that up. All right. I thought, I thought, I remembered long hair. <laughs> so, okay, all right. Justice is daddy, yes. Okay, and our visitor here, Jeremy Osceola. All right, we're glad you are here. We welcome you, and we invite you to come back if you would like to. Um, we're not fancy here, you can tell. We're pretty laid back and relaxed. But you know what? All of us love God, and we love one another, and that's the bottom line. Amen. Amen. And we have some visitors over here. Uh, they have driven in uh, from uh, Saginaw. Uh, on this end, I believe this young lady's name is Kaylin. Is that correct? Kaylin. And the one next to her, um, I think her family calls her Lily, but doesn't Sophia sound much prettier? Doesn't Sophia sound better than Lily? I mean, really. Lily and Sophia, I believe, is the, the full name. And next to her is my daughter, Melissa. Y'all come here, I need a hug. <laughs> Melissa Rochelle, and she doesn't like that. My Galen. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. Hey, great girl. How are you? I love you. I am good, good, good. You. Growing up, I'm How are you, young lady? You baby girl. Take those high heels off. <laughs> she can't even walk. She's not better than you. <laughs> okay. Now, did I cover everybody? I think so. Good morning, Pam. How are you with your new Bible? Woohoo! Yay! Don't you love it when you get a new Bible and it just opens up a whole new world? You read your old Bible, and, and it's very familiar, and it's, it's a friend, right? Who still uses a real hold-in-your-hand, turn-the-pages Bible? Who still does that? Most of us still do that. There, there's not an iPad, a phone, a computer anywhere that can give you the intimacy of holding that Bible in your hand. There's something about holding it and turning those pages and crying real tears that drop on those pages and underlining something over <laughs> or drawing stars or, or arrows or, or put a date of, okay, today this is. 
right? There's something about that that not one electronic device can do for you. <laughs> Kenna's still like, well, you know, if y'all could have seen him many, many years ago, uh, when we went somewhere, it was a huge briefcase. I, I'm talking, looked like a suitcase briefcase that he carried all of his books, not all, just select books and Bibles. And we would go somewhere and he would spread out in a half moon of, you know, and either lay on the bed or lay on the floor with all this spread out where and on his desk all spread out and it took him a lot of time to study like that and then when electronic study helps came along he can do in a matter of moments what it would take him a lot longer to do before and so he can cover a lot more ground all of us can do that but still there's no way to replace yeah yeah, sometimes he comes out, we, you know, we sit in Shiloh in the mornings and pray and study and that kind of stuff. And, and sometimes he comes out with his computer, and then sometimes he's got an armload of <laughs> Bibles and stuff, you know. So I know it's a get down and get real when he comes out with an <laughs> armload of, of Bibles and books. So, all right, um, let's see what else. Miss Michaela, don't look at me like that. You know what it is. <laughs> Stand up. Tomorrow, you will be what? 72? Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Erase that. Y'all didn't hear that. 27. 27. All right. All right. Let's sing and, and wish her happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Michaela, Michaela. Happy birthday to you. Yay! I love it. You know, they're our neighbors, and her brother David and his wife Lydia live on the other side of the street. They're our neighbors, too. And you hear David and Michaela hollering at each other, and David, Michaela! <laughs> David! <laughs> Oh, it's fun to live in. Yeah, we don't know what they're saying. They did that on purpose so we wouldn't know what they were saying. <laughs> so we wouldn't understand what was going on. Yeah. But anyway, all right, what else have we? 20, 21, yes, 21 years ago today, we had our first service in this building. We broke ground on February the 14th that year of 99 uh, the guys in the church had laid the pad Johnny did you help lay that pad I know you don't remember I, I kind of had in my head you helped lay the pad and we took off and went away for two or three days and we came back and the pad was done and you know we were having church over in Club Victoria and you haven't had church till you've gone to the club to have, have church I hated every day, every Sunday we walked in there. I did not like it, and I begged the Lord, please hurry, do something. I can't stand going to church at Club Victoria. Uh, but it housed us from February until July the 4th. And once we got the, the beams up and everything, and at least we had walls, we had outside walls, but there was no sheetrock, it was concrete, but we had air conditioning and we had water all of the requirements we needed <laughs> and we threw up those uh, metal chairs in here and on July the 4th we had our first service in here we were independent of anyone else and from February to November Lucille was here Johnny and Kelly were here Jessica was here that's it we built this building, huh? Oh, Robert, yes, Robert was here. Yes, I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, we built this building in under a year, debt-free. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. That's good, isn't it? Yes, sir. You have to talk into the microphone. The people out there want to know what you're saying. 
I'll never say a word again. Oh, you write that down. We write that down and date yeah. that, and it's uh, 1027. <laughs> you, you caught me. Uh, <clears throat> the, the word that she was struggling with is Victoria, Club Victoria. Uh -huh. That's victory. Right. So you went from victory to victory. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, you can talk again. All right. You're forgiven. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. And Mr. Dandy Cox. You know what? I like calling him Dandy Judge. What do y'all think? <laughs> He's a dandy. And Mr. Cox, we are praying for y'all. So, uh, well, they can't see y'all. So if you wave, oh, well, they can't see you waving. Um but we wish you a happy birthday, and let's all sing happy birthday to Dan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dandy Judge. Happy birthday to you and many more. Amen. Yeah, okay. So, um, and Jeremy, I'm looking at the light on the camera. <laughs> Somebody last week said, who was Kenneth looking at? He kept looking back there and said he's looking at the camera. So that little light means if I can see that, they can see me. <laughs> All right. Um, what else do we have? Um, let me see here. I, I know I have notes somewhere. Let's pray for Bob and Carla and then Miss um, Sandy. I want you to come give us an update on your dad. Um, most of you already know, but for those that don't, um, tomorrow will be two weeks ago uh, that Bob was diagnosed with cancer. He had been having a really bad pain in his back that no medicine, over-the-counter medicine would touch. Went to the doctor, they gave him a high-powered pain medicine, and it still was not affecting the pain. And... Um, Carla Sue had called me and asked for prayer. She said he's, his back is hurting awful bad, and the medicine is just not helping. And when she said that to me, I knew by the Spirit of God it was cancer. Of course, I didn't say anything. What do you do when you know something by the Spirit? Pray. You pray. You don't say anything until the Lord says say something or until it's confirmed and revealed, right? Or revealed and confirmed. And... Um, they came by the house uh, Monday two weeks ago, and uh, they had gotten some pretty alarming news concerning all that they found. And so we're going to pray for Bob and Carla Sue because even though Bob is the one battling the cancer in his body, it takes a family to overcome. And not only do they have each other, they've got us. Amen? I said they've got us. Amen? Amen. So let's pray for Bob and Carla Sue. Father, in the name of Jesus, we hold them up before you. You know exactly where they are in spirit, in soul, in body. And we join ourselves together as a body in faith with them, for them, to pray and stand with them for the completed work of healing in Bob's back. I thank you, Lord, that as we've already prayed, you've already begun the work in him. You've already started the process. And though it is a process, it will be a victorious testimony of the goodness and power of God. And, Father, we hold up Dan and Shasta and Margaret and everyone else that is battling something for Herman and Betty and Sandy for everything that they're battling physically financially because physical problems disease is expensive it's very expensive so we ask you to move in their behalf in spirit in soul in body and in their finances in Jesus name and the people said amen amen now give us an update okay like i said last week my my dad had had a um, subdural hematoma six weeks ago and last week when I told y'all he had to go back to the doctor Monday for them to check him because he still had some fluid on the brain well he went Monday and they did 
the fluid was still there. So the doctor had set, was sent in the surgery for this coming week. Uh, they were going to have to go back in. Well, ch Tuesday morning, I go every morning and every night uh, to the house. And I got to the house, and Daddy's usually always already in his chair, and he's already fed the cats and stuff and, and got his Dr. Pepper and sat down. And Mom was in there. Yeah, he's got to have his Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Mom was in the living room, but Dad wasn't in there yet. Mom said, I don't know what's taking him so long. He's been up for a while. So when he started walking in, he was dragging his right leg. And he was having trouble with his hands. So uh, I told Mom, I said, you get on the phone, you call the doctor, and you call him now. And the doctor said, get him to the ER now. Well, they went back in, and he had another bleed. Um, and he had some weak vessels on that side. And so they went in and got that fixed and got the bleed taken care of. And the next day, he was up drinking his Dr. Pepper <laughs> and talking could say his name, could uh, tell you his birth date, and was doing really, really well. And then all of a sudden, he quit. He just, they'd ask him his name, and he'd just look at you like, I don't have a clue what you're asking me. So he just started sleeping. And the doctor said he's got, they did CT scan. They took him immediately and did CT scan, and he had swelling on the brain. And they said that the brain was trying to shift back because it had shifted so far. And so, um, you know, God does wonderful things. He puts people in your lives that, that tend to help tremendously. We had a teen roper that was a real good friend of ours, and his daughter was his nurse for the last couple of days. And oh, heavens to Betsy. <laughs> they have had several rounds. <laughs> Which is a good thing. It was a good round. Uh, she has challenged him, and he can remember his birthday. He cannot remember his name, and he cannot remember mom's name. He knows that's his wife. Uh, his speech is affected as of right now. Um, but he is setting up, and he is starting to eat and drink now. And hopefully today we get to go out of ICU. We've been in ICU since Tuesday. They took the last drain out this morning. They had three drains in. Um, he stood up yesterday, so we know he can stand. He is not using his right hand. He's eating with his left, so we're not sure if he's having some trouble with his right hand or not. So starting tomorrow, they'll start doing the therapy. The therapy people will start coming in and evaluating what's going on. Mom did say that the caseworker asked today, if we had home health here, and she said yes, and he's, she said um, if he has to go to a nursing home, and Mom said that's not an option, he will come home. Uh, so just pray that the swelling start. The doctor really, really, really thinks that the swelling, when the swelling goes down, that everything will start coming back. And that's what we're standing and, and standing on right now, that everything starts coming back. And Mom said he's real laid back, which is not my dad. You know, usually he's wanting to get up and go do something. This little girl is challenging him to eat, and, and they'll just fuss at each other and argue. And she asked him his name yesterday, and he goes, I don't know. And she, tol she told him his name, and she, he said, well, I was just trying to make sure you knew it. <laughs> so he's being, he's being more dad than he has been being. So just keep praying for him and praying for mom. She's doing really well. She's eating well. She's, she's resting when he rests. Um, they won't let any of us go up. Uh, since she's the one that went in with him, she has to stay with him. So they won't let us go up with her or, or switch out with her or anything. So, you know, just pray that he, the swelling starts going down and he starts getting everything back and we get him home and get him going good. Yes, thank you. Don't, don't leave. I want three people who sense the anointing on you right now to come and let's lay hands on Sandy in proxy for her dad and her mom. I want three people to come up. And if more sense the anointing, come on. But I want at least three people to come and lay hands on her and pray. And let's believe God together for Herman, for Betty, for this whole family. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. 
we thank you that you are the God that is more than enough. That these obstacles <laughs> are powerless against the power of God. And we thank you, Lord, that you're moving in the behalf of this family. You're moving in Herman's behalf, in Betty's behalf, in Sandy and Walter and Josh and Dwayne and Jessica and Cade. You're moving in their behalf and you're showing them your goodness. We ask you to intervene by your power. We stand on your word that says, by the stripes of Jesus, Herman was healed. And we declare in the name of Jesus that he shall come forth strong, well, and whole. In Jesus' name. Father, I call this brain into divine alignment. I call it into alignment with the way you created the brain, the spine, everything to come into divine alignment. I speak to the swelling and I command you to go down in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you're moving supernaturally in his brain, in his head, in his skull. And Father, I thank you that you're bringing every part and portion of his body into divine alignment and divine order in Jesus' name. No residue, no residue effects in Jesus' name. Amen. And the people Amen. said? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You got something. No. You ready? Um, Connie, do you have a specific song? Not really? Okay. Okay. Because we have the privilege and because it is our honor, let's sing a few of these patriotic songs. Um because it's our privilege. Amen? And if you don't have one of the little booklets, uh, y'all don't have to um, compliment me on my, my books. <laughs> you, you, I know you can't tell they're homemade. I told Loopy and Connie they were twenty nine ninety five a piece. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to sing these three songs, My Country Tis of Thee, uh, the first and fourth verse and then mine eyes have seen the glory the first and fourth and America the beautiful the first and fourth so stand up and let's just honor our freedom and honor this country and let's just be patriotic okay <laughs> let's just do it my country so Just in case you want the words. 
<laughs> Just in case. Most of us know the first verse of these patriotic songs, but beyond that, most people don't. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trembling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. As of today, we have been in ministry 43 years. Say happy anniversary! <laughs> 43 years of serving the Lord and trying our best to obey what He has said. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. For amber waves of grace, for purple mountains, majesty above the Eden plain of America, America, God shed His grace. Oh, 
the freedoms we enjoy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is not on the list. I don't know if we have it in the words, Lucille. Trust and obey. This has been on my heart for two or three days, several days. And if you were brought up in church, you've heard this song at least once. It says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and for all who will trust and obey. So let's sing it together. We don't have it, do we, Lucille? Okay. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. words to adoration all 37 verses of it this is a long song a very worshipful song we first heard it back in the 80s was it in the 70s leisure suit days okay a long long time ago do you remember his name, Mike? 
Adkins? Okay. I couldn't remember his last name. I think he wrote this song, and he used to sing it way back on TBN years, years ago. On the PTL Club, yes. I loved it then, and I love it still. If you know it, sing with me. But either way, just let's, let's give the Lord praise and thanks and honor today. Worship Him, for He's worthy of our praise. Praise.
We do worship you. Presence is so sweet. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your strength. Father, we come before you. We approach your word. We approach it with expectancy. We approach it asking you that the spirit of wisdom and revelation be made manifest to your people. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us insight. Give us direction. Give us breakthrough in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege, as Cindy said early, earlier, of coming together and worshiping and feeding and feasting upon your word and doing it without fear and doing it without being concerned that someone would dare to try to interrupt our worship and father we just give you the praise and the honor for it in jesus name amen y'all can be seated i'll tell you what you really don't realize how 
important being able to do this without um, any kind of fear of uh, interruption or being taken to jail or anything of the kind until you've been to a country where that was the norm. And uh, we had the privilege of spending some time with a, with a man that's, I think now he's in his 40s, but uh, when he was a kid, he was part of the underground church in Romania. And he told some very interesting stories, let me tell you. Very interesting. And it makes you appreciate what we can do uh, freely. And uh, we don't need to take that for granted. Amen. Well, do you bring your Bible with you? I want you to go with me, please, to two places. Turn to the 100th and 11th Psalm, 111 Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 111, <laughs> 111th Psalm, and also to John chapter 14. I want you to look both of those up, please. John chapter 14. Psalm 111 and John chapter 14 we are still talking about honor and the honor of God this is our third message in this series we're going to begin with Psalm 111 it's 10 verses long we're going to read the entire psalm Psalm, Psalm 111 says, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endureth forever. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given meat unto them that fear Him. He will ever be mindful of His covenant. He hath showed His people the power of His works that He may give them the heritage of the heathen. The works of His hands are verity or truth and judgment. All His commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and reverend is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Our God is a God of honor. He is a God of integrity. And He is a God of truth. Moses said this in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9 to the house of Israel. He said, Know therefore, you need to know this, Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God. The faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. I want you to realize that God is a faithful God. He is a God that keeps covenant. He is a God of mercy. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. God is not a man that He should lie neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Hath he said, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Again, our God is a God of honor, integrity, and truth. And because our God is a God of honor, integrity, and truth, he is different from the gods and the idols of man's invention. Every single God that man has ever devised is a God that cannot be trusted. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. There is not one single idol that has ever been made by man regardless of the race or the culture 
or the people group or whatever the case may be, there is not one single idol that has ever been devised by man. There has never been one single form of worship that has been devised by man that their God could be trusted. If you go back and you look at the idols and the gods of different nation, look, nations, look at the gods of Rome, look at the gods of Greece, you realize that every single one of them are moody, emotional, capricious, fickle, just pick any adjective you want. Not one single one of them is solid in any direction. And when you woke up in the morning, if you were an idol worship, you had, worshiper, you had no idea what kind of a mood your God was going to be in. He may be in a good mood. He may be in a bad mood. And if he's in a good mood, things may go well with you. But if he's in a bad mood, that's just tough luck, Charlie. But you never knew. Now, they were gods that always had to be appeased. And maybe if you jump through enough hoops and you did enough things right or you made enough sacrifices, maybe you could catch your God in a good mood and He might bless you. I'm sorry to say that's a lot of, of, of people's thinking about our God. But I want to say to you that our God is not that way. But I want you to realize that in all of the history of man, there has never been a faith-based form of idolatry. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. There has never been a faith-based form of idolatry. Why? Because natural man has never conceived of a God that is a God of honor and integrity ever. Why is that the case? Because when man invents his own God, it's always in his image and likeness. <laughs> the gods that man creates, the gods that man produces, are a reflection and a picture of himself. But I want to say to you that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of Israel, the God of the church of the living God is not that kind of a God. He is a God of integrity. He is a God of honor. And He is a God of truth. Hallelujah. And when He speaks His word, it does not change. And it doesn't matter what kind of a mood God happens to be in. If God said it, that's the way it's going to be. He is a God of honor. He is a God of integrity. And He is a God of truth. And because He is a God of honor and because He is a God of integrity and truth, He demands faith. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not, but you all know the Scripture. Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Because God is a God of honor, because he is a God of integrity, because he is a God of truth, faith is the only proper response to him. And it's the only thing that is acceptable to him and to refuse to have faith in God is dishonorable now you think about it for a minute think about the parent child relationship if you have a parent that has been honorable to their, ch to their children their whole life they've been truthful they've been a parent of integrity They've been a parent of their word. And then their kid begins to grow up and yet has no trust for them. Well, I don't know. I, you know, 
I we I just don't know. If, I, I don't know if my dad will do that or not. If you or my mom will do that or not. If your parents have been people of integrity and you have that attitude towards them, that's dishonorable. Not only is it dishonorable, it is absolutely, totally undeserved. And if that's true of, of say, a parent-child relationship, how much more is it true of the God of heaven and earth? It's dishonorable to not trust God. It's dishonorable to not have faith in God. Faith can only be the proper and honorable response and in fact because God is a God of honor he has the right to demand faith of us because he is a God of integrity and honor and truth now one of the things that you need to realize and God knows this faith and trust has to be developed over time Oral Roberts used to make the statement, God doesn't have any trouble with good, honest doubt. <laughs> and particularly if you're in the beginning stages of a walk with God and you've never really exercised faith in Him and you've never really trusted Him, it has the feel of going off the diving board. And it's like, God, you said this in your word and whew, I've never done this before, but I'm going to trust you. It has the feel of going off the high dive. You know what I mean? And when you jump, you hope to God there's water in the pool, because if there's not, you're in serious trouble. Isn't that right? It kind of has that feel to it. But at the same time, as you progress, as you, as you move forward in God, things begin to to develop and you have begin to have testimonies of God moving in your behalf Paul said it this way in Romans 5 Romans 5 verses 3 through 5 he said and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience you walk with God. It's really scary, particularly in the beginning. But as you continue to walk with God, you begin to have experiences with God. You begin to experience God's integrity. He begins to answer you when you pray. You begin to see God moving and working in your life. Said in patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And I know Cindy made the announcement this morning. I didn't even realize it, but it's true. We've been in ministry 43 years today. And back in the very beginning uh, of our marriage, we had moved to Oklahoma, and I've shared this with you, but Cindy prayed a prayer that was dangerous. And uh, the prayer that she prayed was... Uh, we were she was was it brother copeland we were listening to brother copeland and he was telling one faith story after another and she prayed and she said god i want stories like brother copeland now unless <laughs> if you pray that prayer and say god i want some faith stories i want some faith testimonies let me tell you if you pray that prayer brace thyself Get ready, because you're going to have some. And I've thought back over it through the years, and when God was dealing with me about this, we've seen God move in our behalf in such marvelous, wonderful ways. We can testify not only from His Word, but from experience. Our God is a God of integrity and truth and honor and faithfulness. Even when we're screwed up. Yay! That's a good thing. But I thought about it, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, partic and it seemed to be for us, at least for the most part, in the financial realm. But how many times have we, would we hit a financial wall and I reached a point where I would sit back and I would say, God, we've been here before. <laughs> <laughs> and you got us out of this area and this area and this area and I would go back in my mind and just remember 
and just recount all the times that it looked like disaster was on the horizon and how God would move in and intervene. That is the benefit of experience because you can sit back and say, God, I've been here before and you delivered me again and because I've been here before and you've delivered me in the past, I thank you that you're delivering me now. And so as you continue to walk with God, you begin to develop a faith in His integrity. And again, God knows that the development of faith in His integrity takes time. But what's difficult is at some point, if you are ever going to have a walk with God, at some point you have to be willing to go off the diving board. For the, there's got to be a first time somewhere. And so in the very beginning, it can be very, very scary. And it's very interesting because, for example, if, if you go back into the Old Testament, we won't take the time to look it up. You can read it in Genesis 15. God appeared to Abraham. And this was the very beginning of the plan of redemption being released into the earth and it was the very beginning of a man learning to walk by faith and not by sight so God appeared to Abraham and he said you're going to have a child he's going to come forth out of your own loins and he said all of this land I'm going to give you and Abraham asked the question he says how can I know that God didn't get mad God didn't get upset. God just said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And God made a blood covenant and swore in blood to Abraham, what I said to you I will bring to pass. Now, fast forward 2,500 years later. Here's an old man by the name of Zacharias. He's standing in the temple. He and his wife have been believing God for a child. And suddenly the angel Gabriel shows up and gives the announcement that he and his wife would have a child. You remember his response? Zacharias said, How can I know, seeing I am an old man? I've done some research on that. Uh, he had to be uh, less than 50 years of age because they made the priest retire at 50. I'm an old man. Well, I'm 63, so he said, I'm an old man. You remember what Gabriel said? He said, how can I know? Gabriel said, I'll tell you how you know. You're not going to say a word till that kid's born. And so Zachariah said, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> So why is, it, why is it that God responded one way to Abraham and another way to Zacharias? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, Zacharias was a priest. He had access to the Word of God. He had 2,500 years of written experience in the, in the Jewish Scriptures. And he knew the Scriptures as a priest had access to them. So for him to turn around and say to God, How do I know? Was unbelief that was an affront to God. Now, it wasn't when Abraham said it because Abraham was at the beginning. But when Zacharias said it, it was an affront. How should he have responded? Oh, thank God I'm going to have a son. You, God, you did it for Abraham. You're going to do it for me. That's how he should have responded. But he didn't. And secondly, I highly suspect that not only did he have the written word of God to go to, but I highly expect in Scripture indicates this, that he, had, he and his wife had been walking with God for a long time. And they probably had some stories and had some experiences. But instead of looking back, you remember the old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. Let me say that when the manure is hitting the rotating oscillator, that is the time to sit back and remember <laughs> how wonderful God has been to you in the past 
and he will be wonderful to you again. Why? Because our God is a God of honor, integrity, and truth. Building trust takes time. Building faith in God's faithfulness, building faith in God's integrity takes time. And that's true not only in your relationship with God, that's true in your relationship with people. I mean, there are people that come into this church. Now, we've been here 23 years. And, um, you know, there are people that come into this church. They don't know us from Adam. Jeremy, did I say it right? This first time Jeremy's been here. You know, I mean, he didn't know one way or the other. As far as he knew, I might have taught out of the Koran. I mean, he didn't know. And, you know, people come in here and they don't know. I remember the, we were talking about Betty and Herman earlier. How long have Betty and Herman been coming, Sandy? Huh? Four years. I remember the first time Betty came. Betty came before Herman did. First time Betty came. Bless her little Church of Christ heart. The first time she came, uh, right, be right before I, I was going to preach, she stuck her finger in my face and she said, I've heard about you. And I said, is that right? I've heard about you. And if you don't teach the Bible, I'm going to call you on it. <laughs> and I just said, okay. I didn't have a problem with that. She didn't know what I did or didn't do. And so, you know, you just go on and do what you've got to do. Of course, now they've been here for four years. Now, there have been times after church when Betty's walked up and she's always pointing her finger. Now, I don't know why that is. We love Betty and Herman. But there, she'd point her finger in my face and say, You've confused me. <laughs> And every time I hear somebody say that, I think about it. a lady came up to Brother Hagin and said, Brother Hagin, you have confused me. He said, Lady, when you go up into an attic and turn on the flashlight, you don't say, My, 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 look at all the dust this light caused. He said, The dust is already there. The light just shines on it. And he said, lady, all I did was shine on your dust. He said, you were confused before I got here. I just brought it to light. <laughs> well, dealing with somebody that, that, and I'm talking about on a human level here, dealing with relationships in the very beginning, trust has to be developed. But now if somebody like Robert who's been with us 30 years or Lucille who's been with us 20 plus years walks up and says I think you're a fraud and a charlatan well not a lot I can do about that because if I haven't proved honor and integrity over 20 30 years I mean over decades there's there's nothing left but did you and did you know the same thing's true with God what else can he do? You know, and all I can say is, well, you know, you're not here at gunpoint and that door swings both ways, so you got a decision to make, you know. But I want you to see it takes time. It takes time to develop that kind of trust. It takes time to develop faith. Now, I said all that for a reason. Go over to John 14, please. John 14. Jesus says something, particularly in the light of what we've just said. Jesus says something here. It's absolutely amazing. <clears throat> you know, and there are some people who leave church just because they don't like me. They don't mind what I teach. They just don't like me. And I, you know, myself personally, like the song says, I think to know, know, know me is to love, love, love me. That's just, I may be a little prejudiced. <laughs> but you can't do anything about that either. 
All right, John 14, 1. Jesus said, let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. He's speaking to the disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now that is an absolutely amazing statement because I said to you earlier that because God is a God of integrity and honor and truth, he has the right to demand faith. So now here's, here's Jesus saying to these men, you believe in God. I mean, they, they, their whole life being Jewish men, their whole life was, was dedicated to believing God. The, 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 the young male child started learning to read Torah at three years of age. And he said, you believe in God, now believe in me. And what makes this interesting, first of all, is that Jesus was making the same demand of his disciples that God made of Israel. And he's saying to them, I want you to have faith in me the way you have faith in God. That is a remarkable statement. Because in order to make that statement, the assumption has to be made, or what he was saying to them underneath that statement very simply was, my honor, my integrity, and my truth is as impeccable as the God of Israel. That's amazing. And later on in this chapter, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me and in essence he's saying trust me I want you to trust me and I want you to trust me exactly the same way you trust God now they knew who he was thou art the Christ the son of the living God but I want you to hear it what he said I want you to hear it through their ears how would you respond to a preacher that said, I want you to trust me the way you trust God? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I may trust you, but God gets my trust more than anybody else. But he made that demand. I want you to trust me the way you trust God. Can you see how, how just... Uh, I don't want to use the word outrageous, but I can't think of another word to use. And you can tell the impact that that had, because go down into this chapter. Here's where we're going to begin to camp for a little bit. <clears throat> John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. That's what the King James says. It sufficeth us. Let me put it out. Let me put it in modern English. Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. I can almost, I can almost just see Philip standing there with his arms folded. You want us to believe in you the way we believe in God. Well, then show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. You can tell that this is a statement that has really had an impact. Verse 9. Jesus saith unto them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Verse 10, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now in these two verses, 
he basically is asking, he's responding to Philip's demand with a question. And basically what he's asking him is, have I not yet proven to you that I am a man of honor? Have I not demonstrated that to you in three and a half years of ministry? And not only that, but that I walk in the honor of God. Have I not, have I not shown that to you yet? That's remarkable. In other words, he's telling Philip, if the God of Israel demands faith from you because he's a God of honor, and if I am a, 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 a man and, a, and as the son of God, am I, if I'm not a person of honor on the same level with God, do I not have the right to make the same demand? Am I not a person of honor to you? Am I not a person of integrity to you? But now notice this here in verse 10. I want you to take note of a couple of phrases here. He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father? I want you to take note of that phrase. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? I want you to take note of that relationship. I'm in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now I want you to, to put a marker there in John 14, because we're going to use John 14 as a springboard, but we're going to bring some other, other scriptures into this mix. And the first scripture that I want to bring into the mix is just a chapter over in John 15. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Now, where does honor begin? Where does honor start? If you're going to honor God and you're going to receive honor from God, which is what Jesus just said here in John 14, all honor begins, listen, all honor begins with a commitment to the commandment of love. All honor begins with a commitment to the commandment of love. Now Jesus, taught, uh, in referencing this relationship, says, I'm in the Father, the Father is in me. All right, John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and abide in His love. To be a person of honor, to abide in the honor of God, and to give honor of God, there has to be a commitment made to the love commandment. Now, to be, to be, listen carefully, to be in the Father and have the Father in you and you be in the Father, it is necessary that you and I become people of honor. Now when you take that and you trace it on into the New Testament, the term that Paul often used was the term in Christ. To be in Christ and have Christ in you, the requirement is made that you and I become people of honor. It's absolutely necessary. Now, let me mess with your theology a little bit, or at least expand your thinking a little bit. Uh, 
when we use the phrase in Christ. I'm in Christ. We use it as a term referring to being born again. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Then you are in Christ. Are you with me? Uh -huh. And that's absolutely true. That is a correct usage of that word. Let me just give you a couple of scriptures on the screen. You're all familiar with 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That happens immediately in the new birth. Isn't that right? Uh -huh. It does, doesn't it? Well, Paul used this phrase being in Christ in reference to a kinsman that was born again before him. Romans 16, 7 says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who were also in Christ, or they got saved before me. That's a proper use of that term. That's a proper use of that word. And you need to realize that when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are put in into you are immersed into the body of Christ first Corinthians 12 13 says for by one spirit are we all baptized or immersed into one body we are members of the body of Christ we are in Christ are you with me now this is not new stuff I realize this I you know I know you guys know this already but I, I, I'm laying the groundwork here in, in the fact that I understand the traditional use of the phrase in Christ. But I want you to see it now from a little different perspective. Did you put a marker in John 14? All right, hold it there. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. We haven't covered this kind of ground before, and so I'm trying to go over it relatively slow because uh, we need to grab hold of a couple of things here. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen. If you guys would point and click, you'd get there quicker. <laughs> Play it. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen. I got to tell you a story. Talking about that, when people started getting Bibles on their phones, you know, things like that, it made Rick Renner so mad when he would preach. He decided that all the congregation, particularly in the United States, he said he decided that 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 the, there was just a spirit of rudeness in the body of Christ because he said every time I would say turn in your Bibles everybody got out their phone he said here they are getting on their phone when I want them to look at the scripture he didn't realize the Bible was on the phone <laughs> anyway <laughs> verse fourteen for the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, let me read this to you out of the Amplified. This is absolutely amazing. Verse 14 says, For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us. I don't know about you, but I want to come to that place where I'm dominated by the love of Christ. For the love of Christ controls and urges and impels us because we are of the opinion and conviction that if one died for all, then all died. So in this verse 14, he is beginning by beginning what he's about to say, referencing coming under the control of love. Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. 
and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again verse 50 or verse 60 wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh yea though we have known Christ after the flesh yet now henceforth know we him no more now what he's let me let me back up to what Jesus said John 14 9 Phillips asked him the question show us the father Jesus said Philip have I been so long with you and you have not known me in other words have I not proven to you that I am a man of honor all right read verse 16 again wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh yet though we have known Christ after the flesh yet now we henceforth know we him no more what is he saying you want to know if a person is of God or not see if they're a person of honor you can't be you can't walk with God and not be a person of honor now from the theological standpoint you may be born again you may be in Christ Jesus you may be saved but the context of verse 17 is not about being saved the context of verse 17 is honor read verse 16 again wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh yet though we have known Christ after the flesh yet now henceforth know we him no more verse 17 therefore if any man be in Christ if any man be a person of honor he is a new creation old things are passed away behold all things are become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation now let me let me say this in talking about being reconciled to God what what divided man from God in the beginning Huh? Sin did. Adam sinned. Every sin is an act of dishonor. Man became separated from God by dishonor. And in becoming reconciled to God, we must make that transition back into honor. Okay. Verse, nine, or verse 18, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, To wit or to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The whole plan of redemption that God set in motion when man felt the whole plan of redemption was a manifestation and a demonstration of God's honor. But now notice what he says here in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech or beg you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. He's not writing to the world. He's writing to the church. 
You need to be reconciled of God to God. God has demonstrated His honor to you in providing the plan of redemption. A God of honor and truth and integrity did everything He could to get His man back. And so now, church, you be reconciled to God. How? You become people of honor. Verse 21, for, <laughs> did you know you don't begin a thought with for? You don't walk through the door and just start off saying for, or <laughs> walk through the door and say, but, <laughs> this is a continuation of the thought concerning honor, verse 21. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And again, I reiterate, as I've already talked about in this series, our righteousness is based on the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus and the blood of Jesus plus zero. Right? We've been made the righteousness of God. However, <laughs> that righteousness has to be developed in our lives. And the only way it can be developed in our lives if we, is if we make the commitment to become people of honor. You follow that? Now, one of the things, let me remind you, one of the things that we've already established in this series to be righteous and to walk in righteousness empowers our words to come to pass. We've already talked about that. You couldn't even get saved without that principle. It's not enough just to say, well, Jesus is Lord. Anybody can say that. But Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. What? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The, the, the faith in the heart receiving the righteousness of God has to be the prelude to making that confession of faith, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. That is, the, that is the necessary prelude for that confession to activate the new birth. You can say Jesus is Lord all day long, but until your heart has reached out and, been, and received the righteousness of God, those words are ineffective. Righteousness empowers our words. Now, we've already talked about that in this series, but I, I want to bring that back to your attention for, for where we're going. Now, go back to John 14. We'd be having Bible study this morning. John 14. How much time have I got, Sandy? Okay, we're good. John chapter 14 Verse 9, Jesus saith to Philip unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou, show us the Father? Have I not, have I not proven to you that I'm a man of honor? Verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. If I have not proven by my character that I'm a person of honor, then the fact that what I say comes to pass ought to prove I'm a person of honor. And the works, what are the works? The signs, the wonders, the miracles, the things that I've done 
ought to demonstrate that I'm a person of honor. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sake. Even the Pharisees, as obnoxious and unbelieving as they were, came to the conclusion no man could do these works unless God were with him. Even they figured that out. Acts 2.22, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he says this about Jesus. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know. And Jesus is saying here, if, if, if I have not proven I'm a man of honor, I've never lied to you. I've always told you the truth. I've been a person of integrity my whole life. If you don't believe that, believe the word. And you know, we know from our, this side of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. His whole life, he never missed it, he never blew it, not one single time. And then you got this squirrel, Philip, going, we don't know if we can trust you or not. See? Well, God gets the same rap, see? We, God, we don't know if we can trust you or not. We don't know if we can. What an affront. All right. Again, verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now, here's where we're going to leave the ordinary. <laughs> what kind of works? Signs, wonders, and miracles. Do you want to see that happen in your church? Okay. <laughs> then you need to become honorable, you ugly thing. <laughs> I'm playing. Um, contrast, contrast this just a moment. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You don't need to go back to, we won't need to go back to John uh, 14. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to contrast this with something. Oh, no, first, did I say 7? 1 Corinthians 1, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, and we'll read down into verse 7. Let's start, well, start with verse 4. 1 Corinthians 1. He's writing to the church at Corinth, Paul is, and says this, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift. And you may want to take a note there. The word gift there is the word charisma. He's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. He said, you come behind in none of the gifts of the Spirit. They got together. They'd have church. They'd have tongues, interpretation, prophecy, gifts of healings. They had all kinds of things going on in church. He said, you come behind in no gift. You come behind in no charisma, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But now wait a minute. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you went into that church, you'd think, whoo, man, these got to be the most spiritual bunch in town. They got all these gifts going on. They got all these charismas in operation. Man. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
<laughs> verse 1. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For where... For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? This was one of the most carnal churches in the Roman Empire. But yet they had every gift of the Spirit in operation. When you got to write to a church and say, don't get drunk at communion, you got a church with issues. Right? And when you've got a guy sleeping with his stepmother coming to church and anytime anybody tries to correct them, they say, oh no, isn't the grace of God wonderful? <laughs> you got issues. But they had all the gifts. Now listen to me carefully. You can be a person of dishonor and still move in the gifts of the Spirit. Now what that tells me is this. There has to be a dimension of power beyond the gifts of the Spirit as we know them. And in order to tap into that realm, we have to become people of honor. And you're not going to tap into that realm until we become people of honor. You can have a church of dishonor, Corinth proved it, and have all the gifts in operation, but you never will step over into that higher dimension of power until you become a person of honor. Signs, wonders, Miracles, the works of the Father. Jesus walked in that on a higher level than what they did at Corinth. Now let me explain something to you about the gifts so you're not confused. Smith Wigglesworth summed it up this way. He said, I stretch my faith just as far as I can get it knowing that there's nine powerful gifts of the Spirit to make up the difference. The gifts of the Spirit are intercessory tools of the Spirit. They make up the difference where we're lacking. And what you have here is a church of dishonor and walking in such carnality. The gifts are having to make up the difference a lot. You follow me? You come behind in no gift. It would seem that this church was so carnal that the only kind of ministry God could get in there was through the gifts. I mean, God will use any available tool, honorable or dishonorable. We'll talk about that next week. God will use any available tool. I mean, God spoke through Balaam's donkey. I've always taken a lot of comfort in that through the years. But what we're talking about is something that goes beyond that. And Paul talked about that. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Am I messing with your theology? I'm making you think that's what I want to do. Nothing else make you think. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. And he concludes this chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, he concludes it in verse 31. He said, but covet earnestly the best gifts. What is the best gifts? Whatever you need at the time. If somebody needs healing, they don't need to be prophesied to. Right? 
Okay. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show unto you a more excellent way. Not a more excellent way than the gifts, but a more excellent way of flowing with God. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. And what Paul is saying here is you can move in the gifts of the Spirit, but until you make the commitment to the love commandment, or till you make the commitment to become a person of honor, you're going to be very limited. And even if you're a giver and a sower of seed and you believe in the laws of seed time and harvest, until you become a person of honor, you're going to short circuit your harvest. Isn't that what he said? Though I give all my goods to feed the poor, give my body to be burned, and I don't choose to become a person of honor, waste of time. And then beginning in verse 4, he describes what it means, or he gives the description or the characteristics of the love of God. Interesting thing, every one of these characteristics describe a person of honor. And amazingly enough, they describe God. God is love. But now watch what he says in verse 9. Pick it up. Well, let's pick it up in verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. As long as we're just flowing in the gifts of the Spirit and haven't chosen to be, to be people of honor, at best our moving in the gifts will be fragmentary. I want to see manifestations of the power of God in this place, but I don't want a bunch of Pentecostal rinky-dink junk. I don't want a bunch of Pentecostal yay, 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 yay. Man, I want the real deal. All right. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come... <laughs> then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, go to your good Baptist commentary, and it will tell you when that which is perfect is come is referring to Jesus. This is not referring to Jesus. It is true when Jesus comes back, things are going to be considerably better. <coughs> No argument there. But he didn't say when he which is perfect is come. He said that which is perfect is come. And the word perfect there in the Greek is a word that refers to maturity and development. Gee, I wonder what we have to develop in. Honor. Well, what is that which is perfect is come? Well, let me just give this passage to you. Ephesians chapter 4, let's find out. Verse 11. says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors or shepherds and teachers for the perfecting, oh, same Greek word, the perfecting or the maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Same Greek word. When that which is perfect, mature, complete is come. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ when we become people of honor 
that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You become a person of honor, you'll be able to see through a lot of foolishness that's being preached. Carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Dishonorable men trying to preach the gospel. But speaking the truth in love or in honor may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. What is that which is perfect is come? It is the development, the maturing of the body of Christ so that we become people of honor. Verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, when we grow up and decide to become people of honor, then that which is in part shall be done away. We'll no longer have the power of God being fragmentary. We'll no longer be walking in a low level of the gifts of the Spirit. We'll be walking in the same level of power, not as an individual, but as the whole body of Christ that Jesus walked in when he was on the earth because we're people of honor. Hallelujah. You got that? When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought I was a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. When we decide to become people of honor, the gifts of the Spirit as we know them now will become like children's play toys. I don't want that. I want this. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also, I, even as also I am known. What is he saying? Let me tell you something. You may be a bum. <laughs> you may be one of the most dishonorable people that has ever walked the face of the earth. But you know what? God doesn't see you that way. You know why? He's God of faith. He believes in you even if you don't believe in yourself. Huh? He does. <laughs> Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's how he sees us. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. I will, when I make the commitment to become a person of honor, then I will become the person that God sees me as. Follow that? And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Close it off with this. Did Jesus walk in the gifts of the Spirit? Yes and no. He walked in the, he walked in the gifts of the Spirit in the fact that he was dependent on the Holy Ghost. That's what he said when he stood up in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to do certain things. He was totally dependent on the Holy Ghost. I won't go there because I don't have time to explain it. But he was totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. Now, what were the works? What was the power? Close it off with this. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5. Says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who is that? Jesus. All right. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom shall and understanding now notice this yes he was dependent on the Holy Spirit but Jesus didn't move in a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge he moved in the spirit of wisdom and understanding it was still dependence on the Holy Spirit but he was as a man of honor he was walking in that at a higher level than just word of knowledge word of wisdom 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That last one, the fear of the Lord, that is the foundation of everything. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is synonymous with being honorable. You follow that? The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord and shall make him of quick understanding or quick scent in the fear of the Lord and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes neither reprove after the hearing of his ears but with righteousness developed righteousness honorable righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked why will his words be that powerful because he's righteous why is he righteous he's honorable and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins this honor thing is important. If we want the power of God manifested in our midst, not just victory harvest, but throughout the whole earth, because I'm not just speaking to people here. I'm speaking to people online. CDs are going out to different people. I'm speaking to the body of Christ. If we want the power of God displayed, we must commit to be people of honor. We must commit to the love commandment. Did you learn anything? Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I thank you, Lord, that you are causing us to become people of honor. You are leading. You are guiding. You are directing us and showing us how to become people of honor. Father, we honor you today. We honor you with our praise. We honor you with our ears, a hearing heart, hearing ears. And I thank you that as your people progress and go through their week, that you lead them, you guide them, you direct them in the ways of honor. And Father, I pray this morning over the tithes and the offerings of your people. You said in Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with your substance and with, with the first fruits of all your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, e correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delights. Loopy and Connie and I were talking this morning. I don't know if you realize it or not, but God can straighten your day up if you need it. Part of becoming an honorable person is be willing to be corrected. And I've made this statement to them. I'll make it to you. The Lord said this to me over, well, probably 25 years ago. He said, judgment doesn't begin with earthquakes and fires and floods and coronavirus and <laughs> He said, judgment begins when God quits talking. When God becomes silent. When you become a person that's resisted the voice of God and resisted and resisted and resisted and resisted and resisted. And resisted. When God quits speaking, you're in a danger zone. Correction is much better. <laughs> As difficult as it may be, it's much better than the silence of God. So, Father, in our giving today, we receive your correction if we need it and where we need it. And I thank you that you're molding and you're shaping us as people of honor. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being with us. Thank our visitors. 
Justin, Jeremy, both J's. Thank y'all for being here. Amen. Jeremy and Jesus. Jeremy and Jesus.